Meltdown in three, two, one. What the f oh, Well God, done. I the race with frickin' King 8. This is the Valley of Unhappiness. You want to discuss the hand, really? Idiot player. It's just unbelievable. This kid probably won't last another hour. Like, this kid has all the chips. He probably won't even make the final 200. <laughs> moron. I have pocket tens. <laughs> I had pocket tens, and he just decided to go crazy with 10 7. Man, a guy had no money involved in the pot, and he just felt compelled to try to run it over. Can I even play in this game? I mean, what the f they find? Oh, I mean, what the? F Today's hand of the day is brought to you by 888 Poker. Hey guys, it's Alex Torelli and welcome back to the hand of the day. For today's episode, I decided to mix it up and bring you something fun. I'm going to leave the Hello Alex series aside and due to popular requests from a lot of you guys, my readers, I'm going to do a fun episode. Something with a little less, uh, little less strategy, still a lot of strategy, but just a fun hand that I think you guys will really enjoy. So I'm bringing you today's hand of the day from an episode of Poker Night in America that I played in Choctaw, Oklahoma with the one and only, the legendary, Phil Helmuth. This hand, Phil Helmuth opens in mid position with the classic 7-4 of hearts. He was opening all my big blind. I guess he was going after me. Maybe he just felt like playing a hand. Maybe he was stuck and losing and tilted. Who knows, he's Phil Helmuth. And uh, Roger Simple calls directly to his left and I am in the big blind. So I'm gonna play a lot of hands here. I'm in the pot with Roger and Phil. They like to tango. I know they play in their home games together a lot and both very action players. And of course, there's nothing like the chance of playing a hand of poker with Phil Hummuth, right? Some things go beyond math and uh, like a lot of people in the world, uh, they like to get in there with Phil because if you win the pot, there's gonna be a story. So this hand was a story in the making. I looked down at King Nine of Hearts and I know I'm in for a ride and I decided to call. Flop comes pretty sweet for me. 10, 9, 3, all with two hearts. And here I have a lot of options. This is where I'm gonna get in a little bit of the strategy. And there's three different options I could take, right? I mean, I all I have to do to not make a mistake is just not fold. I could check raise, I could check call, or I could lead. I decided against leading here, and I think people get tempted into this, and I think really the consideration for leading and the reason why leading would have a lot of merit is if you expect that your opponent is very likely to raise you on a bluff. So you basically wanna find a way for your opponent to put money in the pot with a worse hand, or you wanna get them to fold a better hand. Leading, it's difficult to accomplish either of those two things by leading. In order for leading to be profitable, you really have to hope that your opponent is going to bluff raise you with a worse hand. If he's more likely to bet a worse hand if you check than he is to bluff raise you, then it's better to check. In other words, if your opponent is more likely to bluff when you check, then checking is better than leading. I think a lot of players uh, in general facing a lead will just fold their air unless they have a lot of equity. In other words, unless they have a hand they would have bet anyway if you checked. Whereas a lot of people, if you check, they're the preflop raiser, they're gonna come out firing, especially with any combination of two overcards here. They're very likely to lead. So that's one reason I, I opted against leading. Um, and the other one is it's really almost impossible that my opponent's gonna fold the worst hand. If they have a hand like a pair of tens, just like queen 10, let's say, uh, they're never gonna fold if I lead. If they have an over pair and they raise me and I jam, they're absolutely never going to fold, right? There's too many possibilities of draws, the pot is too big at that point, and they're gonna commit the money and hope for the best. So I don't really accomplish either of my two goals by leading, and so I opted to check here. Now we're down to two options. Uh, you can either check raise, or check call. Uh, check raising has merit as well, and I think that it accomplishes definitely both of the things that leading doesn't. It's likely that your opponent puts money in with a worse hand by betting his air. It's also likely that he folds a better hand if he has something like a bigger, like ace nine or let's say jack 10. If you check raise him, 
I think that your opponent's gonna fold this flop. There's there's a lot of draws out there, which, you know, a pair of tens beats, but there's also, you know, I could have two pair, I could have a set, and even if I do have a draw, he's 50-50 at best against my draws, and they're crushed against the times that I have two pair or a set. So I think you accomplish a little bit by check raising here, you get your opponent to fold a 10, but uh, you're never gonna get him to fold an over pair. The thing I don't like about check raising, this is my personal approach to, to poker in general, is that it condenses my stack to pot ratio. It makes the hand less playable on later streets. It gives me less options. I like options. I like options in life. I like options in poker. Options let you have more decisions. When you have more decisions, you can make a superior decision. That's how I sort of view things. That's how I view the world. That's how I view poker. And I feel like check raising here just takes a lot of the play out of the hand. Of course, I'm not gonna make a big mistake. I'm gonna get the money in when I'm at like, like at least 50-50. Um, my opponent might fold a better hand. Good things may come. I pick up the pot right there. I like check calling. Uh, I like doing that with pretty much all my hands. It does balance my range, which is something we talked about before, which is like, it, it, it protects my hand, right? When I check call the flop, I don't only have weak hands in my range, I actually have some strong hands that can defend on the turn and possibly the river if I improve equity or if I feel like my opponent's bluffing. So it does balance my range a little bit, which is important, but I feel like it gets me to the river more often with more options. That's what I really, really like about calling in general and also on this flop in particular. So I keep the pot really, really small. If my opponent bets two or 300, I call. We see the turn, I have so many chips left and so much playability left that I can maneuver a little bit. I could dance, I could wiggle around. And I like that option. I like to be able to get to the river, see what happens and learn a lot more about my opponents while they have the lead in the hand and just see what they do. If they check the turn behind, um, when a blank comes, well, I know they have nothing because they would never check a blank turn in position if they had a big hand, they would bet it to protect it. So now I learned so much about my opponent's range that I could play accordingly on the river. I maybe turn my hand into a bluff, I maybe I bet for value, I maybe check call for value. I, I just have options and I, and I like that. So that's my sort of approach. Um, but you know, you'd have to really use these three different things we talked about, analyze your opponents to see which category they fit in, and then do which option works best for you according to your playing style. But those are a little bit of strategy on the flop here. Uh, Ironically, the flop went checked around, so it didn't really matter too much about what exactly uh, I would have done, but I think it's really important to consider these different options. Now, I know that's a lot of information, and I have a lot more information about playing your hands and analyzing ranges and making good decisions at the poker table in my book, Four Steps to Beating Anyone at Poker. If you are interested in that, I encourage you to check it out on my website, alectrelli.com. But for now, I think this information will be enough to get you started into making better decisions at the poker table. So let's go to the turn. We get checked around on the flop. Uh, the turn comes with deuce of hearts, absolute gin for me. Now I'm almost sure I have the best hand. It's almost impossible that someone would have checked the nut flush draw on the flop. So now I'm just thinking about how I'm gonna make more money in the hand. Uh, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm debating between two decisions, right? I could bet and hope that someone calls, or I could check. I opted not to bet here, and I did that because I just don't feel like anybody has anything, right? Like put your, one thing I always tell people is put yourself in your opponent's shoes. And what would you do if you were them? That's a great piece of like, advice that I could offer you to think about how you would play the hand if you were them to help think about what they are likely to have. If you're Phil Helmuth here and you raise pre-flop and you, you hit this flop in any way, you're always gonna bet it, right? There's two people in the hand, you're sandwiched between two players. The big line could have anything. Uh, Roger's a guy you play against a lot who you think is a loose player that you're gonna win money off. Like, you're always gonna bet if you flop something. So it's unlikely Phil has anything. Now Roger sees it go check, check. He's gonna bet with anything. Even a bluff he's gonna bet pretty much to you know try and just win the pot and take it down. So I expect Roger to have like pretty much no equity. I don't expect him to have anything at all. So I think that by betting, I just win the pot a lot. And I don't think that, I'm, I mean, while winning the pot is great, I have a hand that's gonna win the pot regardless. So I don't think I get my opponents to put money in with a worse hand, hardly ever. If I check again, I think maybe someone bluffs at it if they have like a heart in their hand. Maybe they have the queen of hearts and they just bluff. Um, so I think checking is just a little bit better here. I check, Phil now bets 400. When he bets 400, <laughs> I kind of changed my mind a little bit. I think that his range could be very polarized in this spot. By polarized, I mean he has likely have really, really strong hands or very select few hands of air. I don't think he has many hands in the middle. I don't think he has something like two eights, for example. Um, I don't think he's gonna bet that big with a hand like that. So I think he, he is really likely to have turned a monster, like a set of twos 
or maybe a flush that he checked on the flop. Phil's tricky enough to do that, but I don't expect that that often. Um, or he just has like the nut flush. He has like ace queen with a heart that he didn't bet on the flop, and now he's just like bombing the turn to try and like win the pot and get people to fold like a weak one pair hand, like a nine or two eights or two sevens or something. I don't think he has like total air. I just think he would bet like 150, do like his little 75, 125, Phil Helmuth, one fifth the pot type of bet. Um, now Roger calls too. So when Roger calls, it's like, I kind of changed my mind about his hand. I don't think he's gonna call with nothing. So I think Roger might, you know, have picked up like a flush draw on the turn and now he's just calling to see what happens. So now I'm in a spot where I would have maybe checked called the turn or whatever, done something a little tricky, but now I'm definitely gonna check raise, right? Either someone has something that they, I misread the flop and someone actually did smash it and they, they now are betting the turn, trying to win a, build a big pot, or they picked up a big draw on the turn and uh, you know I, I wanna protect against that or charge it. So I make it 1600, um, expecting you know probably one person to call. I also have a lot of history in this hand against these players where I've been really aggressive. And you know how when you're aggressive in a session and you're playing against a lot of other people, and you're aggressive, 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 or maybe you see this against your opponents where they're aggressive, 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 like the third time or the fourth time they three bet you or the fourth time they check raise, you start to lose credibility, right? You're like, okay, maybe he has it this time, but for sure in the past, he didn't have it one of those times, or it's impossible that they have it all four times in a row. That's just natural human psychology. You just don't believe them. And I was kind of being very aggressive in this game and I just felt like I wasn't gonna get, well, I wasn't gonna be uh, believed by the other players. So I opt to check raise, I make it 1600, hoping to get action. And to my joy, Phil Hamuth slams it in and he, he goes all in. Uh, I have an easy call, I, you know, see me, I beat, beat him in the pot with my flush and uh, I cooler him. That's plain and simple. I went on a seven minute rant about all this strategy and all the things you should do to earn more money at the table. And it was one of those spots where it didn't really matter too much what I would have done in this specific hand because I would have just beat him for all the money. Oh, you, you were right. Oh, another flush over flush. <laughs> okay. Did he say all in? Thank you. I don't think he did Wow. <laughs> it's the third fucking time in two days it's been flush over flush. They usually have the king high flush, and they have the ace high flush. <sighs> Charlie feels real bad for him. It's all quiet too. <laughs> Fun trip. Fun trip. I'm, I'm sorry, Phil. <laughs> He's talking to me. So, uh, you know, I know there's a lot of strategy going in here, but I think it's really important to, to separate the results from the approach. So, a lot of times your opponents aren't going to have flushes or they're going to have air. And I think people get caught up in like thinking, about the results and correlating that with their play being like, oh, well, it didn't matter what I would have done. I would have lost the money anyway, or I would have won anyway. It doesn't matter what I would have done. I could have led the flop or I could have check raised or it doesn't matter. But what matters isn't what you would have done in this hand. What matters is what would happen in the long term. So I challenge you to separate the results from the long term opportunity and your intentions and not just worry about what your opponent had in this one situation, but what they could have had in the long term in all the possible situations, because that's really where you make money at the poker table. So I hope you had as much fun watching this hand as I had recording this video and playing this hand. Uh, of course, I, mean, I know many of you are probably like me where you grew up watching Phil Almuth and you think, oh my gosh, one day I'm gonna be able to put a bad beat on him. And this was sort of like one of those moments where I didn't put a bad beat on him, but I got super lucky in a big pot and I coolered him. I just was in a situation where we're gonna get all the money in regardless. And I guess what you want more than putting a bad beat on him is just sort of just send him off on a rocket ship for a rant. And I got it out of him. And so it's always one of those moments that uh, I think back to my younger self 10, 15 years ago when I first started playing poker and I just, you know, the kid in me smiles. And uh, not that I ever wish bad on anybody, but definitely it's like one of those bucket list check things that uh, this video was really an awesome, uh, awesome poker moment for me. So I love you, Phil. Uh, he's really a great guy. Phil's an awesome person, away from the table and on the table as well. Um, but uh, definitely a bucket list thing, and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you guys uh, have hands you'd like me to review, 
Um, first of all, send them through my blog, alectrelli.com. I get a lot of hands sent on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, everywhere, and I can't keep up with all of them, and I, I, I can't, uh, especially on Snapchat. I mean, that stuff like disappears in like one second, so I can't, of course I'm not gonna be able to like hand write it down and get it on my blog. So please send it to me through alectrelli.com. If you guys want more uh, of these videos, I'm on Snapchat uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, three days a week, and I take all the Hello Alec episodes and I review them in real time. So you get my raw, absolute, like, unfiltered thought process in real time on my Snapchat. So follow me on Alex Torelli. Uh, and there's also a hand of the day, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, on my Instagram as well. So a ton of content in different places for you guys if you are loving these videos. And I will see you guys next week. Send me your hands. Uh, ciao and much love. Take it easy.